Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, audiophiles and music lovers. Today, I'll be reviewing the Burmaster 101 Integrated Amp. It's not for everyone, but I loved it, and I think a few of you might too. Okay, let's go over the punchline. By popular demand, I like to start these videos with a summary of what I found. On the one hand, that may save you time. On the other hand, it may do some damage to the subtleties of the equipment being tested. Stay tuned if you're interested in that. As I said, I loved the sound of the Burmester 101 amp. The standout quality here is a top to bottom clarity coupled with very low noise levels. What these two factors do musically is to spotlight each musician and enable them to be placed in space in an engagingly realistic way. That's a bigger part of really good audio than I think is sometimes acknowledged. If you very much enjoy listening to musical groups and following what each musician is doing, this amp is your friend. The other hallmark of the 101 is the highly dynamic sensibility that it brings to the music. Again, this is from the bass on up to the treble. That said, there are one and a half limitations here. The one limitation is that this is a medium power amp and won't be ideal for low sensitive speakers in a large room. The half limitation is that the bass is detailed rather than rich and bloomy and the treble is smooth but dynamic and certainly not rolled off. This voicing has to fit with your room and equipment. I'll talk more about that later. Now let's talk about the amp itself. The Burmaster 101 integrated amp is a medium powered integrated amplifier housed in a classic compact package. The amp is rated at 120 watts per channel into four ohms. And while Burmaster doesn't say, I would guess that it can put out 70 watts per channel into eight ohms. Burmaster does say that it's stable with any load that a production loudspeaker might present. In keeping with the styling, the package provides five high-level inputs. Three are XLR and two are RCA type. It has a headphone amp built in along with the optional Burlink control system. The only somewhat unusual feature for a classic integrated amp like this is a button for a smooth function said to enhance listening at very low levels. Accompanied by a streamer and a pair of speakers, the 101, like any compact integrated, could be part of an ideal system for smaller or for shared living environments. I will say that the chrome finish seems less industrial than many electronic boxes that we see today in the audio world. So, Thus far, this may sound like the lead up to an amplifier that many people would enjoy. But I think that obviously isn't the case when you realize that it's priced at $12,000 in the US. In high-end audio circa 2024, that price isn't actually that high. And yet there are many integrated amps between, let's say $1,000 and $9,000 that will generally have as much power or more and these will sometimes have a plethora of additional features. If you are of a mind, and many people seem to be, that audio gear should be priced higher only when it gives you more, that is more features or more power, the Burmester 101 is probably not for you. If you're of a mind that parts, rather than intellectual property and careful detailed design should determine the price of a product, then the Burmester 101 is also probably not for you. Fortunately, in my view, we live in a world where artists and craftspeople and engineers are free to make a variety of products to suit a variety of needs. Airtight, for example, makes a nine watt per channel stereo amp that is priced at just a shade under $20,000. That's a power amp, not an integrated amp. It can sound wonderful. Such amps are often sold out so it's clear that they appeal to a segment of audiophiles. I should also say that on a day-to-day -day basis, I use the Audio Research Reference 6 Mark II preamp in my system when I'm not testing preamps, and that's 
also priced around $20,000 for just a preamp. I say this not to rationalize any price, but to point out that there exists a variety of value propositions in the audio market. If you can't imagine a $12,000 integrated making sense, then I invite you to switch to another video, including, if I may say so, those we have on the Excellent Techniques SU G700 Mark II, or the NAD M33, or the Luxman L507Z integrated amplifiers, among others. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. Now let's really get into sound quality. I've already summarized what the 101 does sonically, but let me unpack this just a bit more. The Burmester 101 has a Class D power amp section. I've listened to over 30 Class D amplifiers made for high-end audio, because beyond that, we all listen to Class D on our phones or in our cars or on our TVs. The point I'd like to make is that high-end Class D amplifiers sound more different from each other than do Class A B amps. So, I want to say that summarizing the Class D sound is a fool's errand for the most part. That said, one technical feature of Class D is that these amps have unusually low output impedance, or high damping factors if you prefer that terminology. As a generality, they have detailed bass and create less of a speaker-induced bass bump. But the bass reproduction varies among these amps as does everything else. The Burmester 101 occupies a base sweet spot in my experience, assuming accuracy is the goal. As with Goldilocks, it's not too dry and not too resonant, it's just right. Now, if you have a bass shy speaker or a bass shy room or both, and you're trying to correct for that with your amp choice, the 101 is probably not for you you may want to visit the tube aisle or the subwoofer aisle of your local audio store. But let me say this, listening to, say, Jaco Pistorius through the 101, playing all over his fretless bass on Joni Mitchell's Hegira or on Weather Report's Heavy Weather, well, I just have to say it was a joy. I loved it. Jaco often plays pretty far up the neck, so this isn't foundational bass stuff most of the time, but when he does go in the other direction, the sound is detailed and full. Similarly, Christian McBride's bass on Long Gone is warm and resonant in keeping with the overall kind of late in the evening vibe, while Thomas Morgan's bass on Bill Frizzell's Valentine is deep, but also clear. On Death Cab for Cuties, just to change our musical background here rather dramatically. Anyway, on their amazing Asphalt Meadows album, there are several tracks where the guitars and keyboards just take off, creating an atmospheric layer of sound, and then the bass comes in as an almost subterranean counterpoint. The 101 presents this counterpoint vividly, and the instruments are beautifully delineated. It probably doesn't hurt that Bob Ludwig did the mastering on that album. This bass character seemed to me of a piece with the mid-range and treble. The 101 places the performers in space beautifully, and you can hear the details of what they are doing without artificiality or stridents. I used the Eben recording of the Mozart quintets to see if violins got edgy, and they sounded beautiful with significant air around each performer. Similarly, on the Minnesota Orchestra recording of the Mahler First Symphony, the first movement was outstanding, with gradual introduction of each instrument presented with phenomenal depth and balance. 
this element of the character of the frequency spectrum being of a piece creates helpful hints to the listener that the sound is realistic. Not every audio component does this. In fact, I might say relatively few do, almost sounding as if it was an assembly of seemingly good qualities that doesn't really form a cohesive whole. But the 101 really manages to pull it together and sound can cohesive from top to bottom. The other standout element of the 101 is its dynamic verve. You notice this especially on snare drums, but also on kick and tom-tom too. Santana's Moonflower is an imperfect live recording, but the dynamics of the performance are very well presented on the 101. I made similar notes listening to Steely Dan's Gaucho, where lesser amps can fall asleep to the oh-so-slick production. One limitation I should note here is that on recordings that are only available in 16-bit 44.1k form, Redbook CD, the sometimes ugly standard resolution upper mid-range zing is not sanded down by the 101. Fortunately, in today's world, many older recordings are being reissued in high res from the original tapes, and many newer recordings were done in high res to begin with. But I have to admit, if you have a large CD collection and you don't plan to shift it over to high res, the 101 may put Redbook CD limitations to front and center. That said, along with high res, the 101 is ideally suited to vinyl playback because you generally don't have the 16-bit 44K CD issues. My foregoing comments really are appropriate if you enjoy listening as a foreground mode. This amp is probably not ideal as a background music amp because it really tends to grab your attention when the music does interesting things. I did try the smooth function, you just press a button, and I can see how it might be good for late night, almost ambient background music. Otherwise, I thought the smooth function was too big an intervention to be used to subtly tweak the balance of the amp. All right, let's get to a summary. If you're not prepared to pair this amp with very high quality surrounding components, I'm not sure the benefits of the 101 will be apparent. It needs other low noise and broadband components to do its thing. It also needs a well-treated room. Without these, your budget may be better allocated elsewhere. That said, the Burmester 101, like every Burmester product I've reviewed, has standout qualities, but those place it slightly off the beaten path. That is to say, Burmester products seem to do some musically beneficial things that most other similar products don't quite manage. They're quite good at making you think about what your priorities are because the benefits are enticing and seem to have trade-offs, at least at first. The 101 is like that with an amazing spatial clarity that works very well on a system with other high-resolution components, but perhaps isn't voiced exactly as you expect before you start listening. I think the 101 would pair beautifully with smaller Burmester or Wilson floor-standing speakers, in a medium-sized room. I used it with Magico A5s in such a room, and the pairing was delightful. The 101 would also seem to be great for pairing with speakers rated at 90 dB or greater efficiency, like the YG Ascent, especially if solid bass is part of the package. Those examples are by no means definitive, but intended to illustrate where I think the 101 could strut its stuff and the class of equipment where it might fit in nicely. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please click on the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which contains more reviews and audio news. The link is in the description. Finally, we would invite you to subscribe to the Absolute Sound magazine. We've been publishing it for 50 years, and it has some of our flagship reviews and ratings. Thanks for joining us, and we hope we'll see you again.